Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And now we are coming at you with a brand new weekly episode where we talk about everything going on in the world of music. We also have a discussion topic today, which is going to be our 10 favorite songs that are under the length of two minutes an interesting little exercise we decided to do because that's something that i feel like often comes up as a point of criticism for a lot of us is that you know the shorter songs we we don't tend to gravitate towards just because they often represent uh intros interludes or ideas that we don't feel are fleshed out enough so we decided to elect to pick our favorite very short bite-sized songs so if you have any of your favorite sub two minute songs that you have Tell us about them in the comments below. Yes, and we'll be getting to that soon. But before we get to that, as is per usual, let's talk about what's been happening in the world of music. Not a lot of like big news items this week, which is I'm actually glad about because we 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 spent like an age talking about the Frank Ocean Coachella situation in last week's episode, which was an amazing discussion that ended in a total existential meltdown. Classic jams and tea. <laughs> but we have nothing of that magnitude this week, which I'm glad we don't because... It would be too much if we did. But yeah. there have been some really exciting announcements of new records that are coming on the way, accompanied by interesting single drops this week that I want to highlight. First up, biggest artist who announced a new project this week is Miss PJ Harvey, who is finally coming back with her first new record, Ooh. first new album since 2016's The Hope Six Demolition Project, which was a good album that I think got a little bit underrated when it came out, just because PJ had built up such a level of expectation for her releases, especially off the back of 2011's Magnetic, Let England Shake. So I think Hope Six Demolition Project deserves a revisit. That album, not one of her greatest, but still a really, really strong record that didn't quite get the love it deserved. But PJ has fully taken advantage of the adage absence makes the heart grow fonder because it has been seven years since that album and finally she's returning with a new record titled i inside the old year dying which is an amazingly pj harvey-esque title like straight out of the late 90s pj harvey era accompanied by uh the lead single which is a song called a child's question august uh, which was a really haunting, sparse, minimal return for PJ. It promises an album that is going to, I'm sure, confound expectations from an artist who essentially can be relied upon to basically change her whole style almost with every album she puts out. A restless innovator. So I'm really, really excited by this. It's mm -hmm. produced by Flood and John Parrish, uh, who have been regular collaborators for, for her on Ooh. previous records as well. Uh, it is... Yeah, it's actually crazy to think that, um, as the Stereo Gum uh, announcement page says, we haven't had any new music from Polly Jean Harvey since the Obama administration. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, that's one way of marking Jesus. time. So yeah, this is really exciting. I really like the song, although it is very deliberately low-key, kind of a bit of an understated preview as opposed to a grab you in the face return. So I'm excited to see how this evolves. PJ is definitely an artist who's not that she ever did really care for what people thought, but she's certainly moved into this very distinct plane. Reminds me a little bit of Laurie Anderson almost, where it's just basically complete disregard for mm. any expectations about her and not necessarily, and not particularly afraid to do something that maybe will challenge people uh, more than gratify them. So yeah, really enjoyed the song. Highly recommend it. Uh, really excited to see what happens with this upcoming record, which is going to be dropping on the 7th of July. Second announcement that definitely fell under the radar. And Jake, I have you to thank for me even being aware of this because very few publications covered it. Sierra Gum wrote about it and it just wasn't on my radar at all. But XCC's Andy Partridge, the legendary songwriter, who head of that fantastic New Wave band, anyone who knows me knows that XCC is one of my favorite bands of all time. They've, of course, been inactive for over two decades now. But Andy is back with a new band called The Three Club Men. Uh, very funny title, the idea of club men, hmm. considering that what this project is, is essentially a very ornamental folk project, very much in the vein of albums like Skylarking, Apple Venus, a little bit of uh, Oranges and Lemons in there as well. This, they've dropped a new song, their debut single, Aviatrix, 
It's fantastic. Honestly, I wasn't I didn't have much of an expectation for this because Andy hasn't made music in two decades. And he you know he's talked a lot about his writer's block and his frustrations with making music. And he's a notoriously kind of difficult figure to work with creatively. So I wasn't necessarily expecting anything all that, you know, mind blowing. But man, this is great. Like this is really fucking good. Like it's it's like I said, it's straight out of that skylarking Apple Venus playbook, but it's like a lot more layering than either of those records. Like just dense layers of beautiful ornamental folk with multiple vocalists, this really kind of stretching huge song that has me really, really excited for this project. I'm hoping that an album will be dropping. I presume there will be. But yeah, I'll put a link to this below because it's kind of hard to uh, find this track. But it's called Aviatrix from the new band, The Three Club Men, featuring XCC's Andy Partridge. Go check it out because it is a great song. One thing I wasn't expecting that happened, um, in fact, just the day before we record this, but a few days by the time it'll be going live, is that we had an announcement of a new single from the legendary theatrical emo project, Say Anything. Of course, the brainchild of the you know, leading voice in angsty Jewish emo, Mr. Max Bemis. And look, the thing about Say Anything, we reviewed their legendary album as a real boy in our Record Club series last year. It's such an over-the-top, extroverted, just throw everything at the wall emo project that it's just not going to land for everyone. And that's okay. And over the years, you know, the 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 quality of the outputs that Matt has that Max has released under say anything has you know i haven't kept up with it directly very much but it's been i'm reliably informed by connor a mutual friend and, and frequent guest on the show who has kept up with it that it's been pretty not great for for max creatively over the years and he essentially mm -hmm. bowed out of the say anything project a few years back and said basically we're done say anything's over um and now you have this new say anything song called psych which is such a great comeback single <laughs> For, for so, it's so fitting for Max Bemis, for this particular person, if you know him, if you know the kinds of ways he writes, to say the project's over and then to come out with a song called Psych. And of course, the yep. first lyric is Psych, we are born again. We've died and sprung to life, so wet and fresh, wriggling and drooling and gleefully soiling our tights. And I just want to shout this out because yep. this is, now I haven't kept up with the late era say anything. I know that uh, August listened to one of their late era albums and it's like one of the worst albums he's ever heard. So that's really funny to me. But this song fucking rules. This shit goes hard. And I'm reliably informed as well that it is not just that, you know, I, I'm just listening to something new from them and realizing I still like them, but their fans are even surprised by how good this is. This thing knocks Hell yeah. this thing's brutal it is one of the hardest pop punk songs of the year of the last few years you go toe to toe with a peak era my chemical romance song musically it's just fucking brutal in your face brilliant and lyrically it is it's pure max bemis through and through but it is funny as hell and look i do these segments every so often i know it's a very it's maybe the lowest form of reviewing but i just want to read the lyrics here because these the lyrics on this song are amazing Please. i bet you gave up on the children of oasis do you know how fucking dumb you look my patience thin is torn in half in my past life i was gummy <laughs> dead inside and born to die i'm the jeweling c the only thing your blue eyes deal are lies i am half gay splayed and boring and i'm still ignoring you but i'm proud to smile it's my addiction, and I've missed it so. I've missed this. Yeah, oh yeah. Christ ignites, and he plunges down, and it feels so fine to fuck with fire and burn forever. God explodes, and we go, go, go. We are beasts. We feast on the end of time and burn forever. Lachaim, we fucked your wives. They saved our lives. Chop, chop, chop. We stole your members. You did it first, but we did it better. All these cocks to swing about so clumsily, alive with queasy, bleary, weary eyes. Blinking, you'll miss the moral to all of this. The cum is spread. The days are done. The best is bright and yet to come undone. <laughs> and he just goes on like this. It is a complete embarrassment of riches in terms of just the most absurd bars you have ever heard. And believe me, it is the music the the fucking guitars this shit is as hard as he is insane now because of how basically not of this time 
Max Bemis is and how like hashtag problematic he would totally be if he were popular enough for people to listen to him. This is not going to get very much attention broadly, but it is frankly one of my favorite rock songs of the year, just because it's so unapologetic. You know, even if you don't like say anything, and, and I know a lot of people don't, this is the kind of thing you just have to kind of be in awe of in terms of just the sheer nerve of it. You know, it, it, it's an amazing song and I hope it that he brings this energy to the next album. If there is a coming album, I'm sure there is. Because, yeah, Connor and I were both just speechless by how good this was. Um, completely blown away. Now, I didn't get a chance to listen to it, but I know as well that there is an announcement of a new album, finally, from the Gaslight Anthem coming this year as well. They came back with a comeback yep. single as well. Again, haven't had a chance to listen to it as well, but I wanted to acknowledge that because that's very jams and T-Core. I will be keeping tabs on that for sure. And the last new release announcement I want to talk about uh, is one from a project that I mentioned in a recent segment that I'd really, really, their one project that they'd released had really, really clicked for me in a huge way. Um, and so I'm, I've been like waiting for them to release a full length record. That, of course, is the bedroom emo barn burners, Home is Where, who have finally announced their debut full length album, The Whaler. And it's coming out, it's been preceded by the lead single, Yes, Yes, A Thousand Times Yes, which brings the energy, brings the passion, brings the brutality <laughs> that you would expect from this incredible incendiary queer emo band. Just everything that, if you're an emo kid, if you're queer, if you're just, if you wear your emotions on your sleeve and you just love messy music that is not afraid to be entirely brutal again it's the wonder years by way of the hotel year but like doused in transness that's how i would sell home as we are to our audience and the upcoming album again it's out in july it's called the whaler has song titles such as every day feels like 9 11 uh chris farley <laughs> and nursing <laughs> home riot i uh, also just want to acknowledge that the, the the track that comes after Every Day Feels Like 9-11 is called 9-12. A lot of great music announced or released this week that was really exciting to just have one thing after another kind of bombarding my timeline. Now, those are the announcements. A few new EPs that we want to talk about. Um, a couple of them that Jake will probably say the most about, but one that I want to lead off with because it's the most unconventional of the three. And... It's the most, I guess, interesting of the three in a sense that it is doing something a bit different uh, formally than anything else that we're going to talk about today. So I'm really, really intrigued by it. It's something that I think anyone could appreciate what a creative risk it is and how cool and it, the novelty of it is for its context. But ultimately, you will enjoy it as much as you enjoy the music that's being performed. It is a new live EP from 21 pilots who have been commissioned to perform a, a set for MTV Unplugged. Yes, MTV Unplugged, which as I was um, prepping Jake for the list of things we we're going to talk about, Jake, you immediately responded with, they still do that? And that's a, a great thing because I immediately <laughs> responded to that as I well, as soon as I heard about it. And yeah, they do still do. MTV Unplugged still exists. And 21 pilots were asked to do a show for MTV Unplugged. And they turned it into an EP. And what's interesting about it is that, yes, it's a live performance of 21 Pilots music, but the entire performance is constructed from loops that the band are making live in front of their audience. And so they're essentially constructing the tracks rather than bringing pre-tracks and just kind of singing over them. They're coming with their instruments, their synthesizers, and nothing else. And they're building the songs in front of their audience. And in many instances, they build the songs around samples that the audience supply to them live in the moment. So they'll get the audience to cheer or make a sound. They'll record that and then they'll loop that and they'll use that as the core basis for the song they want to perform. Or in one very memorable instance, they get multiple audience members to come up and using their voice, make the sound of different drums. So make a cymbal sound, make a snare sound, make a bass drum sound, and use that as the percussion track for the song they're going to perform. And so it's a really innovative, really creative way to perform live. And it's given this extra like 
weight by the fact that you're hearing these loops constructed to perform songs that you've already heard a million times before whether you wanted to or not because they're hugely radio successful so you're hearing this band essentially recap a lot of their biggest hits but doing it by essentially reconstructing them using their audience so if you're someone like me who is like as into you know like the meta side of artistic creation as i am there's something really like inherently awesome and pleasing about you know the idea of seeing these hugely successful songs essentially recreated using the audience that those songs gave them basically like one there's it's one way to acknowledge your success is basically to use the people that those successful songs brought to your camp to then recreate those songs and turn them into something new the downside is that while i have a lot of affection for 21 pilots and i do enjoy some of their music and i've been very upfront about that in the past it's not a set list that's full of my favorite 29 pilot songs really it's a few of their big hits there's a few examples of of tracks where they essentially like take two songs and mash them together like they have a mashup of ride and lane boy i think um i can't remember the mashups now I, uh, that's annoying me but um they have some really cool mashups that they do but overall the set list is just mostly songs i don't particularly love but that said you know, the, the best song or one of the best songs on their album Scaled and Icy, which we were very uh, negative about, Shy Away, which I think is a song that I've has kind of grown on me uh, since the initial distaste I had for it when we, were, when we talked about that album, is given its best performance ever here. I love the way that they reconstruct that song here. Uh, the, the version of Stressed Out they do is great. The version of um, Power Radio they do is great, even if that is kind of one of the more cringier emo songs on Vessel. And this is the thing, like, I've come to appreciate 21 Pilots a little bit more in retrospect because I kind of, they're one of those bands where I listened to them when I was like 18 or 19. And then I was like, I had this reaction against them where I felt this like, you know, I I hated that I enjoyed them so much because I was so impacted by how like uncool they were in like serious artistic circles but then the older i've gotten the more i've like confronted the fact that i'm just a shameless self-indulgent emo kid the more i've been able to kind of get over that and just embrace the stuff that i did originally love about 21 pilots and just allow myself to love that stuff um so yeah look it's it's execution wise as well i do think that the idea of what this is like doing these cool loops and building them into these songs is more interesting than the execution. Sometimes the execution doesn't quite land. And sometimes you do, I do feel as though the songs aren't quite as good as they could have been if they were played more traditionally, unfortunately. But that's offset by the fact that it is such a creative and daring thing to do. You know, and, and Tyler Joseph says right up the gap that, you know, some of these songs might not work, but we're trying it this way anyway because we want to do it. We want to give it a shot. We want to do something we haven't done before. And it's commendable. And so regardless of how you feel about 21 pilots unless you absolutely hate them but if you're anywhere on the spectrum from love them to can tolerate them i would say this is worth checking out it's a really short ep really creative how they do some of these songs and i wanted to acknowledge it because i think that it's a worthy artistic endeavor and i appreciate these guys sort of challenging themselves and doing something a little bit reflexive and meta at this stage in their career Jake, I know you have a couple of EPs that you want to talk about as well. Um, why don't you jump into those? Well, first thing I want to shout out is that there is a new EP from uh, one of my favorite working artists now, one of the uh, members of the sort of uh, Longinus Records collective that we've been following ever since we reviewed Paranool back in 2021. Uh, Sonhos Tomo Mkanta came out with a new EP called The Movies Aren't Enough, uh, released with a quote from a Julia Holter song on Have You in My Wilderness, which I very much appreciated. Um, this EP is interesting because it isn't like any of the music that Lua has made under the Sonhos Tomo Mkanta name. This is way more similar to the stuff that they put out under Moondaughter. Um, a release that I shouted out 
uh, a couple of months ago um, as being a particularly underrated release of last year that was sort of the ambient pop, slow core, dream pop elements of the the project that could be found in parts of Son Host Tomonkanta's sound, but exclusively in that. There was nothing noisy or abrasive or particularly hard-hitting about it, but it capitalized on it very well, and it capitalizes on it very well here, too. Um, there are amusing song titles like the opener Ego Death on an R slash CPTSD thread, which... Wow! <laughs> Okay, um, the 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 follow up track uh, being a reference to uh, the the Bergman film uh, Wild Strawberries. Um, lots of great stuff on here. It's almost thirty minutes long, and it's a very satisfying experience. But it is that kind of sort of shoegaze ambient dream punk adjacent kind of stuff that, like, you know, if you're into the airier side stuff like vaporwave for instance you probably really get along with this aspect of her sound i want to see how this perhaps feeds into maybe a new sonos tom kanta full-length project because i do feel like it's notable that she's releasing it under this name but who knows at this point uh she's got a certain amount of unpredictability to her that make her one of the most exciting artists working right now and this is just another quality release from her if you haven't heard any of her more ambient leaning stuff uh, up until this point, this is a great opportunity to sort of get in with that and then maybe explore Moon Daughter afterwards. So really looking forward to a new big full length project after this I with her. Wanna, I just want to mention very briefly um, that I appreciate and I didn't know this until someone pointed it out on the Internet that that song title um, I experienced Ego Death on a, a CPTSD thread is like a, a reference to a Foxtail song. Uh, off of their album three called I Experienced Ego Death on an NDE thread. So shout out to this connection ah. between, you know, very different, but equally kind of brutal forms of emo uh, in their own way. I love seeing little threads continuing through the community like that. So I look forward to checking out this EP. That's terrific. The other uh, EP that I listened to is the new EP from Beach House, Become. Uh, this has been teased by the band for a little while now as being um, just songs that they made during the Once Twice Melody sessions that they couldn't find a place for on the album proper. So I was curious when they announced this just because I was like, it's very odd that that is where they would draw the line, you know, like with a project as big and indulgent as Once Twice Melody, it's almost just like it's so anything goes that it's hard to imagine them making material that they would deem that like just wouldn't be able to fit on it just because of how wide and all encompassing the sound is on that record. Uh, an album we reviewed very favorably, but their beach house, they've never put out anything that's less than stellar before. So I was obviously excited to this and it was. It was a lot of buzz on Record Store Day when it was released on vinyl a week before it hit streaming. Uh, but once it did hit streaming, I gave it a listen. And, you know, I, I got to admit, as like another bonus chapter to Once Twice Melody, I think this is basically as good as most of the stuff on the proper album. I enjoy this uh, in a very similar vein that I would one of the, you know, the one of the four sections of that. If they sort of stapled this to the end of it on a huge deluxe edition, it would probably make a whole lot of sense. But as its own thing, it's not particularly distinct or anything new. But if you liked the sound that they've been exploring recently, something that maybe is a little bit less tangible than their sort of earlier days and stuff, but... I still think is no less compelling and captivating. I think my favorite song on here is probably Holiday House. Just really sugary, beautiful, amazing hook on here. The title track, also the closer, is similarly quite fantastic. Uh, this is, you know, essential for all Beach House fans, really. Uh, I can't quite say any much that's distinct about it. But at the same time, the fact that this is stuff that they were like, yeah, I just don't think this is going to be able to make our big, huge, indulgent double album project shows a phenomenal amount of restraint on their part, I suppose. But still, I'm very glad that we have new Beach House music, some great new songs. 
Mm. check it out if you're interested yeah i i I enjoyed this ep a great deal it totally fits in with the mold of the rest of the record in this kind of self-produced era that they've set themselves in where they essentially know really really well how to capitalize on their sound and how to kind of deliver a version of their sound that is at its most refined i definitely think that going forward for beach house like i would like to hear a little bit more risk taken in terms of what they do with their sound like one of the great joys of their album seven was the fact that they got sonic boom to produce it and it added this real sort of additional yeah. edge to their sound and i enjoy once twice melody but it is one of the records of theirs that i think has slightly gone off me a little bit with time but not very much it's still oh. very good but what i like about this ep you know if you rem- cast your mind back you'll remember that once twice melody was released in chapters like it was this double album uh-huh. that was split into these four sections that were released one after the other. And so this is kind of just like chapter five, but I just want to say the most yep. Riley core thing of all time and compare this EP specifically to a release from and a rollout for an Orteca project, that being XI, which wasn't uh. released in four different parts, but is constructed as a, a four section record. And then like, after the release of that e- of that album, they released the L Event EP, which essentially was like the fifth quarter of the album, basically. And so Become for Beach House is what L Event is for Orteker, a collection of songs that are every bit as good in quality as what was on the rest of the record. That also kind of serves as a fifth quarter, you know, an extra slice of cake in case the indulgent, massive two-tiered, you know, mammoth wasn't enough to satiate you but no i think that the song quality here is great i'm particularly taken with the song devil's pool which is an example of something that beach house have been doing more and more with each of their records is how they kind of evolve but stay the same is that you know with each album they make they'll do one or two songs that deliberately kind of call back to their really early stuff and devil's pool has that kind of you know rudimentary drum machine sound that reminds me of devotion their great second record but it's like updated with the new palette of the music they've making more recently so i enjoyed that very much i think the title track is excellent american daughter as well the bassy kind of thick atmosphere that they establish with the the songs on this release makes it really engulfs you on good headphones so yeah echo the recommendation Mm -hmm. if you're a fan of beach house you'll enjoy this for sure Okay, now, those are the new EPs that we wanted to shout out, and now we will have a a few new releases that we want to shout out, albums that we don't have quite enough to say on to justify a full segment in our new release reviews episode, but nonetheless that we want to acknowledge. And Jake, I think you have a couple of of metal recommendations that you've been listening to, metal new releases that you're really into that you want to shout out. Why don't you take the time to do that now? Well, first thing I'm going to mention here is another recommendation from one of our friends a uh, friend of the podcast Andres who is just on top of every left of the dial metal release ever frankly just like we'll just pop into our group chat like basically every day we'll just be like hey check this out and reliably always a fantastic recommendation and this recommendation that he passed along to me this week was really something special from a band called TDK, uh, a Bulgarian sort of avant prog post metal sludge metal band. And they have made some records in the past, but this seems to be the first of their records to really catch on with people. That being a new release called Nemesta. And this album's notable for a couple of reasons, but mainly because it can be sold with the byline, imagine if Black Midi was also the Dillinger escape plan. Boom. There you go. That's what this album's like. And I I really mean it on both of those comparisons is that if you like either of those bands, like a lot, a lot of what's going on here is going to appeal to you. Uh, the lead singer has a very, like, disturbingly similar, almost recreation of the delivery style of Jordy Greep. Like, it's uncanny, the sort of deeper voiced, but kind of 
slick sort of delivery that he often has, but still manages to to imbue it with enough melody to sort of sometimes like be catchy. But these songs are ballistic. Like these are songs that sound like they come right off of Hellfire, but with the avant Prague or avant metal bent that wouldn't be out of place. Well, like on like a John Zorn record, for instance. And it leads this album to being a really tight 35 minutes, but it is an insanely fun experience. In fact, I'd say I'd wager that I enjoyed something like this as much as I enjoyed something like Hellfire. Um, the the first track on here, Pet Kata, one of the best songs of the year, frankly. This album leans into a lot of like immediacy, a lot of, again, brutal prog riffs, time signature switch-ups, lots of fun stuff, but there's also a spacier element, too, that really kind of rounds it out well. It's a very holistic-feeling album, you know, despite being six tracks and 35 minutes long, but this is an all-killer release. Fantastic stuff. If you enjoy stuff from Black Midi, or if you like, uh, you know, we've talked about the Dillinger Escape Plan a lot on this show, if you are a fan of that band, there is a lot to love here. Uh, the sort of alt metal sensibilities that this album does frequently have lead it to be one of the more sort of easily digestible records of its kind. Like you hear Brutal prog or Avant prog or Avant Metal and you think it's like this really heady kind of like cerebral thing. And I'm not denying that there are elements of that, but this is for people who want something to fucking hit them. Uh, and it's great. Uh, I, I'm nowhere near done with this either. I, I could see this rising in my estimation in terms of albums of the year so far. So don't let this one pass you by. Um, another great, great metal album. Unsurprisingly, this week we mentioned uh, the this band announced a sort of uh, project that they're undergoing now a band that we've talked about multiple times on here in uh some like what we've been listening to segments that being bell witch the sort of modern funeral doom metal giants bell witch known primarily for albums like 2017's magnum opus mirror reaper the sort of slow core infused funeral doom metal album that is just imbued with so much mourning and grief that album was made in the fallout of them losing one of their bandmates uh and it has a tangible thick atmosphere to it but that is not the only great record they've made i know that myself and august are really big fans of their 2012 outing longing uh their conceptual 2015 album four phantoms is also terrific i also love their collaboration with aerial ruin uh, which is Stygian Bow, which came out in 2020. And now we have part one of three parts, supposedly. Future's Shadow Part One, The Clandestine Gate. And this is... This album is so special. I am so fucking excited to see what these guys do next because, no, I don't think this is going to reinvent the wheel when it comes to doom metal or funeral doom metal. But if you like what these guys do, do. And if you are on board with the very slow, very, it's it's not exactly something that I can see a whole lot of people immediately getting on board with. This stuff is very slow. It can be very patience trying. And seeing as this is one song that is 83 minutes long, it certainly could try your patience. But as someone who's developed an ear for the slower parts of doom metal and again really likes how this band blend it with sort of post-rock slow core drone metal and post metal even uh this is terrific from the opening part of this where you hear these really subtle organ tones you can tell that there's something different about this one and the movements here are super distinct all of them are really well fleshed out like this is maybe the most dynamic release from the band since probably Four Phantoms. And I just really appreciate their attention to detail. This really does feel like you're being guided into a world on a journey. And it feels like you're seeing these different, like the 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 album cover is like this fantastical boshian landscape. And it feels like you're exploring that. 
And the way it just sort of weaves in and out of their different passages are sublime. There are moments of pure, unadulterated atmosphere and then just crushing, pummeling, heaviness, great clean vocals, great fine kind of like death growls that are on here as well. This is them basically condensing their entire career into one big opening movement. Everything that's been great about them on the past is great here. And they separate it into these very distinguishable moments that feel like they're telling you a story or at least relaying a setting to you. And it bo it both feels very complete in and of itself and very much sets up what's going to maybe happen or progress next from here and i'm so excited to see this because if this is going to be a three-part thing and all these tracks are going to be 80 minutes long fucking i'm so in the bag for this off the bat that like a 240 minute long compilation of this project sounds fucking ridiculous and i'm totally in just because this is so skillful I, I i really really love this project i i came back to this four times this week if that gives you any indication as to how much i love this it's a really easy listen at least for somebody like me and i highly highly recommend it for doom metal aficionados this is a real real treat for you guys and i want to see them fulfill this new arc that they're undergoing in their career because i find it very very exciting it's technically going to be an endless album when it's finished, right? Because it's supposed to loop. The end of part three is supposed to loop seamlessly back into the start of part one, Nonagon Infinity style. So it's going to be That's like... That's right. It's going to be like an endless bell witch and so much material that you'll probably forget that you're really listening to a section you've already heard before if you do play it on loop. So it's like... Yeah, it Bell does Witch have that Henry. kind of uh the the drone metal quality of a band like Sun, for instance. I felt mm -hmm. like you know the influence of stuff like Monoliths and Dimensions on here very very strongly. So I feel like that that prospect of that sort of endless metal album, like God, yes, please give it to me. I'm so fucking ready, man. Yeah, absolutely. I I'm gonna probably wait until the full project's out to listen to it, but I when that day comes it will be like a whole night that i carve out just mm -hmm. to experience that um a notable <laughs> new release that came out very recently and for us it just came out the day that we were recording this but we ended up listening to it and i think we knew fairly quickly that it was going to have to be something that we talked about as soon as possible and that is the new jack harlow album jackman now, I don't care if it's Jack Man or however he says it. And so apparently his original name, by the way, is, is Jackman Thomas Harlow. And so when this album was announced, it's being called Jackman. I was like, what the fuck? But OK, it's apparently it's, his, it's, his, it's his, just his name. And it's the latest album. This is an interesting trend with hip hop artists. And it's a particularly modern trend that I feel like you've seen a lot lately. I know there's loads of examples. The only one I can think of right now is, is Slow Tie with Tyron. Uh, is where it's like the self-titled hip-hop album. Not just the self-titled hip-hop album, but it's the real first name hip-hop album. And artists do this, yeah, especially the after, they, after they achieve a certain level of success. And it'll often be like the album they make after their breakthrough album. Like for Slow Tie, Tyron was the follow-up to Nothing Great About Britain, which was his big album. And it's the idea that as soon as you achieve that ascendancy, you immediately need to make the record that responds to that. And all of a sudden, like you're, you get your introspecting and you're responding to your sudden fame by, by talking about how it's affected you. And that's a very common trope with artists who achieve a certain level of fame very quickly around centered around a particular release of theirs. And so now it's Jack Harlow's turn, you know, Kentucky's own Jack Harlow, who we have roasted in the past we have completely torn this man a new asshole you know, talked about him in our worst albums of 2022 list and his album of 2022 was awful you know come home the kids miss you a truly diabolical record that to paraphrase brian eno when discussing ambient music jack harlow's last album is as ignorable as it is uninteresting a truly impressive achievement now Jack's back with a with the follow-up to that album, 
you know, and as I was forecasting, the more personal record, it is almost half the length of that previous record. It feels deliberately designed on a lower budget, or at least designed to feel as though it's got this feeling of off the cuff, you know, Jack's given it to us raw. You know, Jack's um uh, Jack's delivering something, he's not overthinking it. You know, he's not, you know, he's not putting in the hours the way he definitely did with the last album. He's just completely going off the cuff. He's completely giving us something from the heart. He's doing this interesting pivot into Chipmunk's soul, like specific, trying to capture that energy of like, you know, late registration, graduation era Kanye, you know, with the sampling on this thing. And the songs are bullet brief they're one two minutes there's one song that's longer than that and ironically it ends up being the best on the album but there's other things this album does that are notable and interesting for jake jake for jack sorry jake ah uh... that are interesting for jack uh that meant that as soon as i heard them i thought okay we have to discuss this and look a lot of this orients around jack's newfound introspection something which was conspicuously absent from his previous record there was posturing and introspection on come home the kids miss you but it felt solely functional and, and it never felt actually insightful whereas the big strength of jackman which is an album that still makes me laugh just to say its name is that jack appears to be much more sincere in his attempts at introspection on this project and as a result you know it carries a lot of the imperfection and the baggage and it certainly is weighed down by jack's tendencies towards leaning into aspects of his braggadocio of his kind of bullish macho posturing personality but there's an interesting dynamic where jack to a certain extent acknowledges that or if not acknowledging it he confronts aspects of the way he is, the environment that he's existed within, the conditions that have made him the way, the kind of person that he is, and the difficulty he goes through in realizing the consequences of living that lifestyle. And he really does appear to acknowledge that in ways that are both personal and even broadly political in certain moments. And he navigates that messily to be sure he navigates that with all of the skill grace and nuance of jack harlow but he still navigates it he still makes an effort here and uh you know there's an elephant in the room with a particular song on this record that where he really zeroes in and tries to make a statement about the cult of toxic masculinity within male friendships and the idea of ruthless and relentless devotion to your brothers and the cost that that can have and the ways in which aspects of male friendship dynamics can be used to protect men from the consequences of truly heinous actions and jack admittedly tries to make a point about this by taking it in a really extreme direction by telling a story. Now, I don't know to what extent it's fictional or real. I assume fictional, but Jack tells a story essentially of discovering of him and his friends essentially discovering that someone, one of their own, someone that they trust and consider a, a member of the gang has done some horrible, horrible things, has, has, has raped women. And in, an, in another situation has, you know, sexually molested children, you know? And, and so Jack is using the most, you know, vivid and brutal examples of of these kinds of awful revelations to make the point that there shouldn't be, you know, th that sometimes there has to be a limit to the extent to which you are there for someone. And sometimes you have to confront the reality of what that limit is, what that limit should be, and the very human cost of that limit existing. And the And the idea that, you know, it's a really interesting song. It's called Gang, 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 for anyone who doesn't know. It's a really interesting song because I don't know if I've ever heard a song, at least in mainstream hip hop, that's confronted the idea that this very specific value, which is so intrinsic in male culture and 
often extends a lot into hip hop culture as well, which is very territorial, which is very based around the idea of family, based around the idea of brotherhood and acceptance and bonds. How do you reconcile that with the reality that people you know are and sometimes will be capable of reprehensible behavior? And where do you, at some point you have to confront the idea that blind allegiance to the people you love can be manipulated and used against you and can ultimately have a human cost in terms of the people that might be hurt by someone that you love or someone you value. And it doesn't have to be, you know, that they've done something as horrible or heinous as the things in the song, although Jack in choosing those topics certainly attempts to foreground the fact that it can lead to this and the situations can be this blunt and ugly and unignorable but you know it's a really interesting topic for a hip-hop song and it's not the only moment of true introspection on the record either i don't think jack is quite comfortable enough or necessarily willing to shift his entire persona and maybe he shouldn't necessarily shift his entire persona into this level of introspection but it certainly showcases a new side of him and I think that this is a song that will start conversations, you know, within the hip hop community, but also within communities more broadly. And it's a conversation that needs to happen. It's a conversation that has been happening in certain circles, but maybe hasn't been happening between the people that we that it most needs to happen between, that being young men who are bullish in their egos and blind in their protection of each other and in their willing and you know, unable to fully deal with the dissonance that occurs when someone you love and someone you value hurts someone else in a way that can't be forgiven. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough subject matter and it's a really admirable attempt from Jack to deal with it head on. And I know that I, we were doing it, we do these sorts of segments to talk about albums, but the song is so all consuming that it's kind of hard not to just focus in on it. Jake, what are your thoughts? I really don't have that many differing thoughts from you on the song or the project as a whole in that it's very awkward. It's very clumsy, but I really appreciate the attempt. Like, And it, it goes beyond just respecting and acknowledging that Jack is putting in more than the bare minimum, but it really does feel like a deliberate attempt on Jack's part to say something, uh, not just to say something like pointing, but to say anything at all, especially in comparison to Come Home, The Kids Miss You, just because it, it's, it, it really does feel like such a stark contrast between an album that is just like struggling to spread itself so thinly that it can't possibly offend the sensibilities of anybody and an album that is almost willfully being antagonistic against people who are obviously going to be within his own community like it's a risky decision to even put this out or make an album like this in the first place and i like a lot of what it's doing and uniformly the sound is pretty excellent like not like amazing not like uh, you know it's not going to win any awards or anything but like i i like the vibe he's going for it suits his very smooth and charismatic delivery that he leans into for enough time so that it doesn't get grating. Like the 24 minute runtime is one of this project's uh, best decisions overall. It does have lots of moments where he, you know, talks about the white privilege that's innate within hip hop, but then just kind of skirts around the fact that he is a complete and total result of that privilege. But like, I don't know. Well, Part of me is like, on the one hand, I'm like, I, I I like that he's attempting to tackle this topic, but at the same time, I'm just kind of like, I don't really understand why you would acknowledge this by going in halfway as like, well, okay, it's so, so non-committal in that respect. You're talking about the song, oh. It Can't Be, which is another interesting track. And it's like, I'm of two minds with this, right? Because it's the the I understand where Jack's coming from to a certain extent, where he's clearly someone who puts in effort 
as he sees it anyway, who has, who has grinded to get to where he is. And I believe that he has. I believe he's probably taken him a long time to work up to where he is. And I can understand feeling frustration when people reduce your achievements in the context of cultural battles and winning certain culture war points. But Jack just doesn't quite have the nuance to thread the needle between these two things. The, the acknowledgement of the privilege that he benefits from and the reality of the fact that it's not solely privilege that got him where he is, you know, and, and, and Jack, I think is trying to make both of these points at the same time, but he doesn't quite have the elegance to be able to reconcile those two things. And ultimately it just ends up being, oh, oh, yeah, you're, you saying I'm white and that's what's getting me all the success in the world, but I'm doing all these other things that can't, none of those you know, and it's like, I understand where you're coming from, Jack. And I and I also understand the frustration of putting in a lot of work and then having your position reduced in a certain way. But it's, this is not the way to address that. It's just very inelegant and it kind of misses the point. And, you know, it's funny as well because he uh, earlier on the record, he makes the point where like, he's, he compares himself to Eminem, you know, and he says that, he calls himself the hardest white boy since the one who rapped about vomit and sweaters, right? And so he, yeah, he's alluding to the success of, of Eminem. He's, and this is a, lot, a thing that with a lot of white rappers is they feel this kind of inherent obligation to acknowledge the long shadow of Eminem on white rappers. But it becomes ultimately constricting and reductive and just sort of pathetic to be honest i would love someone like jack to be able to acknowledge their place in hip-hop and stake out their own ground without feeling the need to be kind of captured by that shadow and maybe jack would too maybe jack would like to not feel that shadow hanging over him but there's an insecurity to jack in terms of his position in the world that i feel like he hasn't quite gotten past yet and so the record is pulled between these two different sides of Jack's introspection. One is this insecurity that he still has about himself, about his relationships, about his position in the world. And the other is like this wanting to genuinely be a better person, right? Wanting to be a better human being apart from his career. And in some ways you get the impression from this album that Jack's career and his ambitions are pulling him away from self-improvement. And that's an interesting dynamic because Jack talks on this album, on songs like Denver, and especially on my favorite song on the record, Blame On Me, you know, where he talks about his fractured and, you know, really awful relationship with his brother. And you get a sense that there's a, Jack is aware, painfully aware and willing to directly confront the cost of his ambitions and the way that he's grown up and the way he's chosen to act and the way he's chosen to be the kind of person he's chosen to embrace. And he's wrecked with complicated emotions around that. And the record really thrives when he's just fully diving into that. But I don't think he's quite at the level where he's ready to see the dissonance between and really confront the dissonance between what he wants for himself as a career artist and how he wants to improve as a person. Anyway, that's some of the most recent new releases that we find particularly interesting that we think are worth talking about. Jake, I want to hear from you at this point. What have you been listening to recently outside of new releases, things that have captured you, things that have animated you, things that have been on your list and list recently? Well, uh, one of the things that I've been doing, just I'm trying to sort of go through the canon of artists that I love that, uh, you know, whose catalogs I haven't fully explored. And one of those artists who I've been meaning to get to several canonized releases of for the longest time now and just haven't is Sufjan Stevens. It's weird just because I have loved almost everything I've listened to from Sufjan. Like Carrie and Lowell up there, one of my favorite records, Illinois, same thing. Um, and like some of the side stuff that he's worked on, I find really interesting. Uh, you know, we reviewed that newest record of his uh, in 2021, I think. And we weren't like over the moon about that or anything. But the cool thing about Sufjan is that even if you don't particularly vibe with one of his 
main or side releases in a year or two he'll come along with something completely different that will probably get you to feel a completely different way about it just because he's that eclectic um but i think one of my trepidations in exploring his work is that and i love his dedication to what he does and his versatility and his maximalism but he's also an artist who's very exhausting. Like, I think Carrie and Lowell is a great entry point for him, despite the fact that it's a huge outlier, just because it is accessible, despite the dark emotional content of that record. It's just so much less than records like Illinois, which is probably why it's taken me a while to get around to listening to what many people consider to be Sufjan's magnum opus in the form of Age of Odds which is a curious album because it's certainly it's it's older but i guess it's so far in the periphery now that it's up there with illinois in terms of albums that are basically considered modern classics now but when you look at it it's like age of odds is such a huge pivot from a lot of the stuff that he had done before like sure he'd started out and done uh, records like enjoy your rabbit for instance which are very heavily electronic but he instantly pivoted away from those and sort of found his strengths in his more folk leaning stuff that is very eclectic and has many different influences from different genres but you know is distinctly not what he's doing on something like here which is this wild indie tronica progressive pop glitchy thing and it's big it's long it's got a 25 minute long closer and for a while i was just like i'm just gonna wait until i'm really in the mood to listen to this and i've had a hell of a week frankly um i i basically the the night after i saw the film Bo is Afraid, which we talked about <laughs> last week, I had an entire day that felt like the opening 40 minutes of that movie. And I was in such an anxiety addled state that I was like, you know, listening to Age of Odds feels like the right idea. It was because I ended up connecting with this album a lot more than I initially anticipated, I think, because it is in many broad strokes an album about anxiety about being untethered about feeling a certain disconnect with with people with connections from society from the world with all that stuff and it is expressed in the most vast obtuse insane way that it has been expressed from uh Sufjan so far and it's great like the the whole way through I, I was really captivated by the vision that he was forecasting here. I think that the front half of this album is like, I said that it was like, you know, anxiety before, but this is like an anxiety simulator. This is like putting yourself into a glitch pop tumble dryer for like the first half of this. And it is so relentless and how assaultive it is that I was just kind of like, yeah <laughs> like the, all of the noises all of the colliding ideas on here they just work for me there's a sort of directionless aesthetic kind of wall that you're just kind of exploring and i can see how that would come across as uninviting or even unengaging to some but i found it really really captivating and the second half doesn't exactly like relent from that approach but it feels a little bit more measured like when you go from like like get real get right through i want to be well feels like songs kind of focus what they are a little bit more uh and as a result you have songs like vesuvius which feel way less all over the place and more designed with a specific intent taking you along this sort of roller coaster ride which is really calculated and precise in a way that the rest of the album isn't and it sort of perfectly sets you up for the insanity of the beguiling 25 minute long impossible soul which what could i possibly say about this song that people haven't said before uh i again can understand being overwhelmed by the repetition the maximalism of everything on display here I just kind of think it kicks ass. I think it's kind of one of the best things that Sufjan's ever done. I, I I really, really enjoyed this record in a way that I'm glad I waited this long to listen to it for because I've developed 
an appreciation for the stylistic attitude that Sufjan brings to this a lot more in recent years. And I I can just really vibe with this in a way I probably wouldn't have years ago, just because I was a little bit more off put by some of his projects, like uh, The Ascension, for instance, which is probably the most comparable major work he has to this. But I think that project is way more full of very specific intense kind of like the second half of this album minus impossible soul even though that album does have its own big gigantic centerpiece but this to me is just it's way more dedicated to its holistic identity and i i really enjoyed it i i think it ranks up there with some of sufyan's best stuff and i know that kind of serendipitously uh when i started listening to this you said you had it had come around to being your favorite sufyan project again as well like recently well, here's the thing is is entirely independent of you listening to this for the first time, Jake. I had no idea you were planning to do that. And you know, why would I? Uh, and maybe it was just the Bo is afraid of it all. Maybe it was just the fact that I was in that mind state after watching that movie. The thing with Sufyan, I've been a fan of Sufyan since I was 14 years old. Every tiny little shift in my life you know, comes with a new favorite Sufyan album that I suddenly have. You know, it just veers all over <laughs> the place. You know, and I did a video yeah. with, way back with Sersha on our favorite suit on the suit discography of Sufjan. And I go back and watch that now, and I barely recognize any of my own opinions <laughs> in that video because I just feel like my, even since then, which was only 2020, my relationship with Sufjan's records has changed so much. Um, but yeah, Age of Vards is, is the one for me. Uh, I feel like maybe that's a bit predictable if you know me, but I just re resonate so much with the mess of it all. I mean, this is the thing about Sufjan. Obviously, his music's been personal before this point, but only incidentally as an illustration of Sufjan's relationship to the world outside of him and to aspects yeah. of culture and things in history that he sees a resonance in. This is the first time where Sufjan essentially just makes an album entirely about himself and essentially about the massive identity crisis and psychological breakdown that he experienced over a multi-year period, you know, in the wake of making masterpieces like Illinois. And so this is one big testament and one big, you know, like Bo is Afraid, it is one huge monument to having a massive identity related breakdown and having to confront all the different ways you are intrinsically broken and putting that into a IMAX scale event that feels as though the scale of your own internal trauma is given as much of a excessive wonder as the scale of your love for Americana and the different aspects of, of the world you live in that have informed who you are growing up as you get with Illinois. And so, yeah, I, I'm just totally in awe of Age of Arts consistently. I think it's a masterpiece. And I think that it is, you know, so, yes, you. I, I like your distinction of, of how the record kind of, I suppose, finds focus in a certain sense as it goes on. I think another way of saying that is just that it becomes more obviously about Sufjan's inner state. And the messy kind of nature mm -hmm. of how explosive his feelings are colors the first half, but eventually it all kind of curdles into this real introspection that culminates with my two favorite songs he's ever made. I can't even pick one over the other. I want to be well. I want to be well and impossible soul. That's my favorite. I... One of the downsides of doing this show so much is that I talk so much and so frequently about art that resonates with me that I start to sound like I'm just playing the hits when I talk about how certain things affect me. Like I start to sound like I'm just, you know, I'm saying something I've said before a million times and it's robbing the power out of those words. But genuinely, I cannot listen to I want to be well without physically losing it. I, I swear to you, I'm not exaggerating. I cannot put that song on unless oh, no, I'm in a context where I can feel as though I'm safe. You know what I mean? I can't listen to that at work. I need to be very careful if I listen to it while driving. 
most of the time that yes. song is too much for me it's just a complete it's one of the truest and most volatile depictions of complete inner self-destruction that i've ever experienced in art and the fact that it is like it is essentially just preamble to the complete immolation and rebirth of impossible soul is i mean it's just stupid the other sort of indie band that i've been going through the discography of of a little bit that I've been talking about on here is that of Wilco. I talked about listening to their album, A Ghost is Born, which I fucking loved. And then I listened to Yankee Hotel Foxtrot, which I fucking loved. And now I listened to Summer Teeth, which I fucking loved. Um, This is very much, this is like the earliest Wilco album that I've listened to so far. Uh, Dug up the remaster of this. And, you know, it, Wilco albums seem to have a very set blueprint that they seem to follow. They're all very long, kind of very sprawling, very eclectic incarnations of alt country, but combining it with kind of psychedelic pop and indie rock and all these other different kinds of sounds, but still rely on the kind of fundamentals of songwriting, song construction, and just what you know about music so that you're always willing to kind of go with the band whenever they might go off of a a strange idea or a different excursion or Jeff Twee decides to get a little weird with it. But Summer Teeth is another exemplary example of why I am falling in love with this band slowly but surely. There are, I mean, amazing classic songs on here, like the opener Can't Stand It, the absolutely phenomenal follow-up to that She's a Jar, the banger A Shot in the Arm, um, the fantastic Via Chicago, uh, where we see Jeff Tweedy talk about murdering his girlfriend. But I love how elemental this album is in comparison to the other two that I've heard, which one of the biggest things I kept coming back to was, wow, this album really sounds like the fucking Beatles. Like, it just really sounds like that he's hearkening back to an era of music and just sort of updating it with his aesthetic proclivities and it really makes for a fun raucous experience that i just get a whole lot out of i i love the lyricism on here it's it's one of the most aptly named albums i've ever listened to because it is very much a summer album but there's a really omnipresent darkness on this record that's very jagged that, that keeps coming up in all of these songs that'll just like some of them will end with like an unexpected lyrical sucker punch that just kind of like really takes you off guard. And I, I, I just can't get enough of it. I love the sound and I love the way that this record seems to sort of kind of reckon back to a sort of a simpler time, a simpler frame of mind, but still the updated perspective with which it's written acknowledges its its darkness and its ugliness in, in ways that feel really stark and really apparent that really leap out at you. And I really, really dig it. Um, I, I'm waiting to sort of have an experience with, with Wilco where I'm finally like, I love all the albums of theirs that I've heard. And I feel like I'm going to get to the point where like I'll get to like my fifth album of theirs or sixth album where I'm just like, okay, now this is like a favorite band of mine because I could see that potentially happening. I still can't wait to get to stuff like Being There, for example. I know you hold that album in particularly high esteem. Um, albums like Sky Blue Sky, I'm just, I'm just very excited. Yeah, Being There is like, you know, it's like if a band sort of kicked off their career with the white by making their white album. It's not their first album, I know, but it's kind of the first record where they basically had a fully formed idea of what Wilco was going to be that wasn't just Uncle Tupelo Mark yeah. II. Um, the things you enjoy yeah. about Summer Teeth as well, I think, are it's worth saying. You know, the the aspects of its of its slightly more colorful sound palette compared to those to Yankee and Ghost are mostly attributable to Jay Bennett as well, who left the band early or partway mm-hmm. through the making of Yankee Hotel Foxtrot, but was a really key part of the creative direction of Wilco in the, those early years and the partnership between Jeff Tweedy and Jay Bennett, you know, the acrimonious nature of that partnership, but also how deeply they loved each other and how well they worked together is a huge part of why 
being there in summer teeth work but yeah i have a lot of fond memories of this album um i i as a as an angsty teenager i resonated with the 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 way in which this record kind of presents an americana landscape and these really jaunty songs and then just laces this dread and darkness into them like you say uh i i uh i have distinct memories of um in my tumblr days as a teenager like posting the lyrics to the song uh how to fight loneliness and getting like a bunch of notes on that uh because i was just like (laughs) yeah man this song is this speaks to my soul and it still does in some respects but i feel a little bit of like distance and slight embarrassment for how i was tumblrifying wilco but you know whatever it's a great record it's got a lot of great songs on it uh via chicago is one of their most beloved songs and the biggest fan favorite is definitely shot in the arm which is probably my favorite song on the album um but but it's it's just front to back excellent it's one of those records that you look at it and you think oh this is wilco before they got really ambitious with yankee but actually it's actually a really musically ambitious and quite impressively layered album in Mm. and of itself i've become completely obsessed with the discography of the australian garage punk band the drones these past couple weeks not a new discovery for me i've always really enjoyed their album feeling kind of free their last album from 2016 where they updated their garage punk sound with a lot of harsher electronic textures and this brutality that felt new and almost industrial for them. And in revisiting that album and spending time with the albums preceding it, I am in the situation that you're in with Wilco, Jake, where I'm like, no, no, this is God tier. This is like pure Riley core that everything this band does astonishes me i feel like i'm discovering a you know i'm discovering a a, a, not that these bands are comparable i'm just reaching for reference points for bands we love but i feel like i'm discovering a new porcupine tree or a new opeth or a new steely dan or a new like fixation that's going to kind of become who i view as the pinnacle of, of artistry stupid and ridiculous as that sounds And what it comes down to is the fact that this band, like I'm not going to spend too much time on it. I'm just going to try and give you the condensed. This band got hard as hell. This band, it's like Nick Cave, Tom Waits in a blender with making as much noise as humanly possible. Gareth Lydiard is the front man of this band as a lyricist, as a writer, very Tom Waitsian, but also with this edge to him, this ugliness and this violence that Tom Waits more or less restrains himself from because tom waits has this sense of like like you get a real sense of place and you get a real sense of irreverent humor from him and gareth lydiard has a sense of humor as well but he has this obsession with like the most ugly aspects of humanity and really leaning into that and and capturing a world and also a political bent to his songwriting as well that distinguishes him from those reference points that I brought up as well. He is Australian, like Nick Cave, and he has a slight Nick Cave element to his voice, but it's really like if Nick Cave stayed in the mode he was in in the late 80s, early 90s, and never became this contemplative, sad old guy, but stayed angry and politically active... And the kind of records that the drones make is kind of just the kind of records you make if you are locked in a room for a year with no windows and just given newspapers every day and just like, you know, absorbing the horrors of the world and then just spewing out these Dylan-esque screeds. Every single album of the drones that I've heard so far has like a fucking desolation row on it. Like there's just some... Hell ability yeah. that gareth lydiard has where he's able to draw together all of the ugly tragedies and violence of the world into these epic screeds where he essentially just lays waste to all of humanity and he does it in a very that's the word i was looking for he does it in a vulgar way like he writes brilliantly and he's a very poetic writer but he's a vulgar one too and he's not afraid to land on images and ideas that are disgusting and if the, any of this intrigues you, 
the record to listen to is 2013's I See Seaweed. I haven't heard every Drones record yet. I've heard more than half of them. This is the the one. And there's plenty that are up there. I've given, so far, I've given three of their albums a nine out of 10, which is kind of almost unprecedented for me. But I See Seaweed is very much verging on a 10. The most perfect album they've made that I've heard so far brilliant balls to the wall violent got everything about the band that's so compelling musically and everything that's so relentless lyrically the final track is like a kind of garage punk version of the 11 minute closer on bright eyes lifted it's everything you would want a a garage punk album with a strong lyrical bent to be gareth lydiard completely consuming me right now this guy, one of the greatest songwriters I've ever encountered. And I realize I'm I'm hyping him up a lot, but it is just like you can tell when you listen to a lot of music and you just go artist after artist after artist, someone who's genuinely doing something different and risky and like just clashing aesthetically with what's conventionally good and right sticks out. And when they're doing it with style and when they're landing it, it's like... Uh, it's a high like no other you know discovering someone who's able to do that and to me like you know this is yeah i i again yeah, I, I, he he's like a nick quaver or tom waits he's that kind of figure and the band bring the muscle behind him to make the albums feel just cantankerous and loud and clanking and brutal and noisy there's quiet moments on them too and they're eerie and and subtle and unnerving but they always come careening back into focus with a banger yeah gala mill Javi La, i see seaweed feeling kind of free those are the four drones records i've heard so far out of six total uh, plus the b-sides album and they're all astonishing so I may do something on them in the future. I may do a solo video or we may do a record club. I have no idea, but I just know that this band is my current fixation. All right. Well, we've talked about a lot already in this episode, but let's get into our main topic of discussion today. What you're here for. If you've just clicked on the title of the video, our favorite songs under two minutes and at the very top of this video jake you summed it up beautifully you said like we do tend to gravitate less towards these kinds of songs just because you know if it's an artist we like where we like to get we like to see them really delve into an idea and really explore it and take it to its fullest potential and a lot of the time you know 90 percent of the time with these shorter tracks they tend to either be connective tissue or they tend to be neat ideas that don't necessarily get explored to the same degree as the fuller ideas and so that can leave us feeling a little bit out in the cold sometimes so i wanted to counter that by really celebrating when artists do this well you could argue that one or two of our picks are interludes but the majority of our picks are fully fledged songs i would say but just songs that accomplish what a great song does in a much shorter format and it kind of makes them all the more awe-inspiring and unique and special for that. So we've got five picks each. So we're going to rattle through them, hopefully fairly quickly, but also while capturing everything that makes them great and what makes them work in such a short runtime. So Jake, why don't you lead off with your first pick today of songs you love that are shorter than two minutes? Well, the first up here, I'm going to start in, I guess I go ascending order with my picks here. So I'm going to start my list with an artist we've already talked about this year, that being Eve Toomer uh, from their album uh, before the excellent record that they released this year, the 2020 album, Heaven to a Tortured Mind. This is an album that's tight construction is one of its chief appeals so a lot of the songs on here are on the briefer side but a track that's always stood out to me is one of the sub two minute ones entitled romanticist and this song is interesting just because for a, a you know an act that pride themselves on being so unconventional this is one of the more conventionally structured songs on the record even though it is one of the shorter ones and Romanticist is actually kind of a pivotal point narratively in understanding the album in that this is sort of the centralized point 
at which the relationship that's sort of being spoken about and it's mostly in tatters by uh, the end of it and is being explored throughout the rest of the record. This is the inception point for it. This is a song that's very much about like, again, as the title implies, the romanticist. This is a very kind of tender song that's about falling in love with someone and being devoted to them, maybe a little bit too devoted as the incredibly catchy chorus goes. It was the swear you got me hypnotized. It's so good. That's a lot of what's the strength in this is that it has a lot of conventionally very hooky song ideas. There's this kind of distant sort of synth tone here that I think is absolutely beautiful. The drum pattern on here is fantastic. All of the instrumental ideas are really elemental and it just serves as a great point of connective tissue for you to understand one of the sort of chief things themes of the record and i think that that's what makes it an interesting pick is that rarely do songs of such concision rely like they're just not picked often for putting such a pivotal point of you know narrative importance on them and i feel like that's you know traditionally because you want to expound on those ideas but by making this idea so brief it sort of forces you to interrogate what this album is getting at so not only is it a very traditionally catchy really unique sound song that you know relies on all of the things that are great about all of the songs on this album but it manages to use its concision to be to the album and to its themes benefit so it's a really interesting song you might overlook it the first time you listen to an album like this just because there are lots of really big lots of really instrumentally dense and just sort of sweeping moments but this is one of those moments of like you know more simplistic sort of psychedelic sort of prince worship here that's just it really works to the album advantage uh and i really really enjoy it yeah there's also something too about the idea of making a song about being smitten with someone and falling in love you know the disorienting feeling of being suddenly all consumed by that making it so short because there's something as a listener where you can't get settled into that idea because it's over and so there's something mm -hmm. about the disorientation of the effect of that that makes again makes it smart to make that song so short because it makes you as a listener yeah exactly it's fleeting like the feeling um my first pick is one of the shortest picks and it is an album intro it is the intro track to again uh, this is another artist i've been talking about a lot recently another recent fixation of mine one mr david sylvian the opening track to his very beloved 1987 album secrets of the beehive september this is about as perfect of a minute of music as there could ever be it's slightly over a minute but the vast it's just the vast majority of its musical ideas are in that 60 second period and it captures this flash of images that represent the feeling of being young and in love and also the feeling of looking upon that period with some distance, remembering these fleeting elements of it. Again, there's this idea of affection and this idea of wistfully looking back on a longing that I think ties it to the song you just talked about, Jake. But the lyrics here are so simple and so fragmented that they evoke so much of the sensation of looking back on, a, on an innocent time where you were in love and where nothing else mattered. And the ephemeral nature of these lyrical fragments and how short the, the song is really forces you to fill the gaps in. The sun shines high above, the sounds of laughter, the birds swoop down upon the crosses of old grey churches. We say that we're in love while secretly wishing for rain, sipping coke and playing games, September's here again. And that's the whole song. It's the simple image, the simple image evoked idea and the arrangement the subtle strings the way they weave around these words the little motif and melody that comes in just as david says september is here again the emotion there it's so hard to place it's melancholic but it's fond and it's comfortable but it's listless it's so hard to place and it's this beautiful little musical capturing of how the emotions tied up in this little fragment, this little memory are so complicated and so impossible to replicate. It's just this one minute song 
that captures better than artists have in whole albums that weird relationship you have with your childhood with the simplicity of what it felt like to fall in love and to be comfortable and not have to worry about what was next or worry about what might happen or worry about where you would go it's a very simple very straightforward song but it in many ways is the most powerful thing on the entire record and one of my favorite sylvian songs in general my next pick is another artist that we uh, talked about recently, uh, but thankfully get to be a little bit more positive this time around because this is Frank Ocean's song Sideways from his album Endless. Uh, another album that's very tight, very much consists of song fragments in many ways. It's kind of a logical progression of the direction he goes off on Blonde, which is an album that is very fragmented and it consists of emotional shards that are not necessarily always fully formed songs and this is that but just like up to 11 and in that respect there's lots of moments on here that have been weird trying to wrap my head around them over the years but the more I've fallen in love with this album as its own experience the more I've just kind of gotten out of songs like this and Sideways is just a really immaculate example of taking an idea and then building on it on a second by second basis. It starts off with this like enormous wave of just synth tone and it is gorgeous. You feel like you're floating in an ocean. And then, you know, Frank comes in, he kind of listlessly delivers some of the lyrics here. And then gradually you get more and more ideas. You get this like really industrial kind of but still sort of subtle drum beat introduced in the midway point. And it's just fucking, it's a very odd collision. It's very like clattering, but there's a lot of industrial undertones here. And then you get the little trap hi-hat that sort of accents that sort of rhythmic element that's just sort of suddenly in the song. And I don't know, I really love how there's a point in which like the middle section of the song where the sound like rapidly will like cut out at different points and then just sort of come back in. And it's just, it plays with your expectations in a really interesting way. And I love it for that. It's an experience that doesn't adhere to any rules. And this song is why. And it just sort of introduces different elements of all of the the genres and the tendencies that it explores in one perfect little minute and 50 second long span. And I just really enjoy it for that. It's always a moment that I look forward to on an album that is full of incomplete thoughts and ideas, but somehow manages to nonetheless be compelling in spite of itself. Yeah, I mean, sometimes the concept is incomplete ideas in general, and that in itself can be really compelling you know frank ocean's an artist who like in the way he writes and the way he makes songs makes you like and i'm gonna sound a bit pitchfork pretentious here but makes you kind of confront the fleet fleeting nature of your thoughts in general like like the way in which you can kind of just go through life and you know every thought is a disconnected moment that doesn't necessarily add up to much else but is still a part of your life god i hope that makes sense to someone else because i feel like i just talked out of my it, whole it makes sense to me my next pick is actually an artist that is known in a certain sense for making shorter tracks in as much as longer tracks or whatever for being able to execute their whole aesthetic shtick in the shorter format just as well as they execute it in the longer format and in a lot of senses, I think this artist's shorter tracks get kind of reductively talked about as interludes when I think that they are as full and satisfying of musical ideas as their longer tracks, to me anyway. The artist is Boards of Canada, and so they have a lot of sub-two-minute songs that I could have potentially picked. But for me, you know, obviously the great short Boards of Canada song is Roji Biv. That is over two minutes so i couldn't pick that one so aside from that the one i had to pick the one i think that most elegantly and beautifully executes a single idea that sums up the entire ethos of the whole project you know in in one little you know wordless 
simple musical idea is the song Olsen off of their landmark album Music Has the Right to Children. This is a single synth line repeating this longing, open-ended melody as this purring, distorted bass just kind of like revs up underneath it like a jet engine. And it's just like this little synth line that feels as though it's sailing into the air like a bird and the world below becomes this hazy blur. And it does this. It's this little fluttering synth line that feels like it's trying to escape the weight of the world for a whole minute. And then that purring bass just gets more and more overpowering until the song just cuts out and you have this beautiful little plaintive set of chords that gives you like the melody that that synth line is hinting at, gives you a resolution to that melody. And it's just like this beautiful full stop on this continuous ascension it's so simple it's so beautiful it, it 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 feels like a good memory it feels like dreaming of being free and then waking up and yeah of course you have to wake up from that dream but you wake up in the glow of how beautiful that felt and it's like obviously i'm projecting onto it it's an instrumental piece of music it has no clear obvious meaning but with boards of canada it's something ephemeral with them where you do you the nature of what boards of canada music is is that it invites you to project your own life your own memories your own feelings onto it and this is one of the most evocative pieces they've ever put out to me it's the most simple in that it's just one idea that builds very simply and then just falls away with a perfect resolution and it doesn't need to be anything else. My number three here is a bit more solidly built as a song. It is because it is by the one incomparable MF Doom on the collaborative project, uh, Mad Villainy. Uh, And this is an album that It's also built of largely very short songs. And I feel like the reason it doesn't have a more reputation for being like a more fragmented project is literally just because it's not as though they ascribe to some sort of established convention of songwriting or beat making. It's literally just like they have made these songs approximately as long as they want to make them because that's how long they're going to remain interesting. These two people who are working at the peak of their powers and just being like, no, these are going to be as long as they need to be. They're going to be cool, interesting, dynamic, and then they're going to be over. And that's what makes listening to this project so enticing and so re-listenable. And one of my favorite moments on here has always been Strange Ways. Uh, This song is weird just because I'm pretty sure the first time I ever heard this song, it was in an episode of an Adult Swim show, I think. Uh, I think it was the Boondocks. I heard that song and I was just like, man, that beat, that beat goes hard. Uh, and it starts out with that that little like stringed instrument. I think it's it's like it it can't be a it might be a violin, it might be a fiddle. I'm not actually sure, but it's that do 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 do, and then it segments into just just some of the hardest fucking shit Madlib has ever made. And then Doom is on here, and he is rapping. This is some of the most poignant, incisive, and brutal looks at police violence i think anyone has ever laid down frankly like there are you know the the fucking bar that stays up in in my mind at least is the paid to interfere with how a brother get his money now who's the real thugs killers and gangsters set the revolution let the things bust and thank us when the smoke clear you can see the sky again there will be the chopped off heads of the leviathan my friend they call him strangers anybody talk to him and they end up in some danger that's the moment on the song that really just sort of brings everything full circle and, you know talks about like comparing the po- police violence to bomb blasts and shit and it's just it's these two guys at the apex of their talents delivering one of their most concise but nonetheless 
interesting, vivid, and colorful statements and just being themselves. And I, I, I really like that for it. I could have gone with several songs on Mad Villainy for this particular one. Uh, Accordion would, it was another choice of mine, but almost felt too obvious just because that's one of the songs on this. So I wanted to go with Strange Ways just because it's a little bit more of a, a deep cut, I guess, if there can be a deep cut on an album like this. I mean, it's a great pick. One of my absolute favorite songs on that album as well. And I want to shout out just the fact that, you know, Madlib, one of the great producers of all time, really great sample sourcer as well, that the that lead stringed instrument you talked about, I'm pretty sure is a, I think it's a cello. And the sample, though, the instrumental sample and the vocal sample, my way is a strange, is actually from Prog Legend's Gentle Giants song, Funny Ways, off of their first album, which is a great classic prog record. Wow. And, and I just remember, because I didn't know that, and one day I was like, you know, independently of any of this, listening to that album, because I wanted to get into Gentle <laughs> Giant. And you, it's not like it's chopped up in any way. It's recognizable. And you you hear him say it, and you're like, oh, oh, that is that. Um, the sample <laughs> was actually taken from a live performance of the song rather than the album version, but it's still recognizable, and I I just love that. But yeah, it's a great example awesome. of everything that both Doom and Madlib do so well. Doom just assaulting you with the wordplay and with the the flow and the construction and and what he's saying and the subject matter as well, completely and all encompassing. And again, it's another example just to bring it back to the whole topic here of one of the ways in which a really short runtime can be really effective is to deliberately overwhelm you, to bewilder you, to just throw you into something and not give you enough time to get your feet on the ground. And Doom and Madlib use that to devastating effect. My third pick is a song that when I initially came, well, when we, we when we initially came up with this idea, because this was actually your idea to do this discussion, Jake. But when the idea was initially floated, I was like, "This is going to be my number one." And then I thought about it more and more throughout the week, and I realized, you know what? First of all, it would be really predictable to make this my number one uh, because it's a song by my favorite band, but also. You know, there might actually be a couple that I think are even better as songs. Uh, but we are basically now in the territory where all these my picks, I think, are perfect songs for the record. But I'm just going to put the obvious Riley core out of the way now so that my last two picks can be a little bit, little bit more left of the dial. And that is Los Capesinos, My Year in Lists. You know, it's a song by my favorite band from my favorite album of all time. So it being under two minutes and having that, those qualifications, it's an instant entry onto this list. It is an incredible song. Uh, we talked about it when we reviewed the album on our record club for How Hold On Now, Youngster. What more is there to say that wasn't said in that context? It's a beautifully rambunctious song about young love. I mean, young love weirdly appearing to be a wee bit of a theme here with, with the David Sylvian song, although rendered in a very different context here. Uh, a song about the rush of lust and attraction at a young age and also how being pubescent and being young renders your way of expressing those feelings as messily as possible, like carving poetry into your door with a Stanley knife, writing endless lists and blog posts, this idea of, of you know, the, the music nerd, the culture nerd who has no way of processing their emotions except writing a list of songs about it, very Nick Hornby, very high fidelity, um, and the the rambunctious punk spirit and sheer rebellious effervescent immaturity of Los Campesinos in this era just rattles through this entire song. One of my favorite Los Campesinos lyrical passages as well. You said, send me stationery to make me horny. So I always write you letters in multicolors, decorating envelopes for foreplay. Damn extended metaphors. I get carried away. Like there's mm -hmm. very few songs that open with this, that with the cheek of that opening right just sending you careening into this bizarre extended metaphor but literalized and then calling that out and then back flipping into a completely different passage and then the way the song takes the idea of you know the nerdy list construction uh, and expands on that in the context of reckoning with the, the idea that you need to improve yourself and then kind of 
touching on the trope of New Year's resolutions as well and kind of throwing all that away and rejecting the idea of self-improvement because you don't believe in the new year anymore. It's just a really cheeky, <laughs> really funny song. And it has one of my favorite Los Kimsinos uh, lyrics of all, which is, you must confess at times like these, hopefulness is tantamount to hopelessness. And I accept that it's time for a change, but not in places like this with people like these. That just describes my entire waking existence on Twitter constantly. You know, this idea that <laughs> I am I accept it's time for a change, but not in places like this with people like these. Like, I am my own prisoner and I entrap myself, but I do that willingly. And I know it's bad for me, but fuck you is my answer to that. That's the whole spirit of Los Campesinos in general is, is like, yeah, I know that I have these really unhealthy habits and that I'm kind of my own worst enemy, but have what about fuck you and go fuck yourself? Have you ever considered that? That's the whole spirit of, um, <laughs> of this entire record. And it's just summed up so beautifully in this sub two minute song, you know, the way that it plays with your emotions, the way that it, it like captures the transience of basically every feeling when you're at that age or when you're in the particular mindset i cherish with fondness the day i met you becomes i cherish with fondness the day before i met you and veers back and forth between those variants as if time has no relevance to your emotions it's just everything i love about this band and a bite-sized package that's so blistering you barely get the chance to process it Moving on from a very Riley core pick to a very J core pick here. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is the shortest song on the entire list between the two of us. In that this is literally like just over one minute. Uh, and this being Brock Hampton's Tupac. Uh, and this is a pretty overlooked song on the Saturation Trilogy. It's on Saturation 1. And I mean easy to see why these are albums that are bursting with with color with with personality and it's sort of you know there are lots of the 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 interlude tracks on these albums but this isn't an interlude track this is its own proper song and this is probably also the simplest song on here and the the backing beat to this just kind of sounds i mean it sounds borderline like a preset it's just this very simple repeating synth melody but it's so somber and it effectively communicates the vibe of the song which is talking about just the lingering specter of your mistakes particularly in regards to addiction and the way that all of that can follow your present self the getting in trouble with the law and the way it affects your relationships with the people in your life and there's almost, there's kind of a story that's being told on here, even though it is lyrically kind of minimal, but there are just moments and passages on here that are really affecting. Like the, I know there's angels on me, all my dead homies, I know they're waiting on me. That like, that part was like, I'm pretty sure that was the lyric that I heard. And I was pretty sure I was going to be in love with like Brock Hampton as an idea, just because this is the first moment of real emotional poignancy on Saturation 1. And it really sucker punches you, honestly, because you get this really fun, really kind of cantankerous pop rap full of all these different colorful characters. And then you just get this, which is so singled out and different and aesthetically just so it's I mean, it's a mile away from everything that comes before it. And there's a lyrical moment on here that really struck me as odd and awkward the first time I heard it, but now just imbues me with a deep, profound sadness which is the end, which is, I or, I know you're praying for me. I knew you used to trust me. I miss the chicken nuggets and the kisses from her. Damn, I miss you, mama. And the chicken nuggets line always kind of struck me as strange. But like, God, it makes me so sad. Like just the idea of being able to connect with your childhood and missing something as simple and as as you know fundamental or unspecial is just like a meal that you know your mom would fix for you and just the damn i miss you mama the, the the wanting to connect with that and wanting to connect with childhood because that was before all of that shit that this song is talking about started following you and that's what the repeated refrain of trouble been following me shadow had been following me it's wanting to go back before that and have it to when things were simpler to to go back to childhood and that's 
a lot of what the saturation trilogy deals with is that you know trying to cope with reality by trying to escape back into the past and it's just it's really effectively captured here and in a way that i don't think would suit the album or the song if it were any longer i mean like this song it comes at you like a bullet and it, it just it has so much impact and i i just it's something that i almost never stop thinking about when i think about saturation how this just sort of comes out of nowhere and i i, I really do love it and think it's one of the better brockhampton songs honestly even though it might appear insubstantial to some people it's like one of the most fully formed emotional arcs on the record and it's it, it's terrific yeah i i definitely agree that it's the kind of thing that blindsides you when you listen to that first saturation album because it is the first moment on the record where you know the the kind of fun party energy is just kind of cut away from to just leave you in the wake of a raw gaping open wound and that's one of the things that amir whose verse it is on the song is so good for is is those moments where you need to kind of just confront how much you your life is a living walking fuck up how much that tears you apart but also how kind of mm -hmm. magnetized you are to that self-destruction the interesting thing about brockhampton i'll keep this brief but you know people of the narrative around them is that people have kind of like a lot of people were into them when they were big in 2017 2018 now a lot of people are like embarrassed to have been into them because they feel like a sense of disconnect with the version of themselves at that time. And the thing that I think was so cool about Brockhampton is that they allowed us, and just for a particular generation who experienced them in that era, no one who experiences them in any other era or comes to them at any other time will really be able to get this. But the people who, who heard them then will get it, is that it allowed you to kind of see a version of yourself and an aspirational idea of this utopian ideal for creative connection through art this idea that all you needed was some friends or some people that you could connect with and essentially the the possibilities were limitless it was this kind of idealism this sheer pure utopian vision that brockhampton represented that could never last forever but that everyone felt as this real tangible thing in that period and that completely consumed everyone's lives if you were a part of that world and what's beautiful about that is that it is this raw utopian vision of pure creative possibility but that it is also so grounded in that increasingly popular trend of in hip-hop of deeply personal introspective ugly real you know talking about your lives and your friendships and your fuck-ups in ways that were candid and diaristic and lacking filters of any kind not that that's entirely a new thing in hip-hop but there was a particular trend in terms of how that was manifesting that brock hampton really i think were emblematic of and so tupac is as perfect a song as any to showcase that it's a kind of death of innocence that that whole pro project represents but it's what makes it artistically compelling and this is a song about the death of innocence all right my fourth pick today is uh the oldest pick on my list really casting the net back into one thing i noticed actually about our lists is that your lists were all like fairly modern i think like 21st century songs um and many including many from the last like few years um, where I feel like it's kind of become more common to have artists doing more fragmented ideas. Um, and your list, I think, captures that trend, if you call it a trend, in a really nice way. Whereas a lot of my picks are kind of more historical and, and kind of like more exceptions to what these artists typically do. However, my last two picks are both from artists who, you know, came up in the in the late 20th, 20th century era of alternative rock music in, in its various forms and playing with form in such a way where shorter tracks are absolutely not all that uncommon and in fact are kind of quite commonplace for these artists. But the songs I've picked for these two artists, I think, are the examples of the artists at their most distilled, the artist using the short format to pack a punch the artist also deliberately leaving you wanting more in a certain sense. 
But in the context of the albums on which these songs feature, you're so bombarded by these fragmented ideas that you only realize how much more you want when you go back and listen to these songs individually. So the first of my last two picks that captures this is Wire's song, Outdoor Minor, from their fantastic 1978 album, Chairs Missing, one of my favorite post-punk albums of all time. And what's interesting about this song is that on the original album, it's a minute and 40 seconds, a minute and 50 seconds. And the band's label, EMI, liked it so much and thought it had so much commercial potential that they demanded the band make a longer version. You know, it's kind of a joke almost. You know, typical label story is, guys, we love the song, but it's too long. You need to cut down and make a radio edit that we can put out there. And here's the inverse of that. Guys, we love the song. Can you add another minute to it? And they did eventually, and they released it as a single in an extended form. And it did quite well um, for the band. But the original form of the song is the one that appears on the album. And it's this, you know, delightfully, you know, wire and irreverent band who write about, you know, various different topics and whatever is kind of consuming them at a particular point in time. This punk spirit, this sense with which, you know, a song can be about anything and can be so abstract as to apply to anything, but re resists any kind of narrative or moment um, and, and resists kind of like because what Wire were, where they were, they were the post-punk band in a certain sense, that they were responding to the punk scene. They were taking the idea of rebelling against the, you know, rambling, conceptual, you know, epic prog music of the 70s with these concise, irreverent, abstract slices of sort of almost post-modern incisive looks at modern Britain and culture and society and these kinds of things and so outdoor minor is just this delightfully peppy and poppy and catchy little song about being enamored with insects and like their very efficient way of living and the the beautiful craft to the simplicity and the efficiency of their existence and how that is a refuge for the singer in amongst the chaotic, you know, ugliness of human of humanity and the way that human society operates. And, you know, but all of that is that's if you want to interrogate the song. Fundamentally, it's just a really sick pop song. Like great hook, a great chorus, these beautiful dreamy guitars, these lovely harmonic vocals, these beautiful tracking effects that happen on the vocals and on the guitars. The pedal that's being used specifically gives it this, it's slightly distorted, it's slightly harsh, but it is really dreamy at the same time as well. Vocalist Colin Newman is like doing a slightly more pleasant and eerie tone than he typically leans into. And it's just a really irresistible pop song just tucked away on the back half of this album full of weird, inscrutable, but strangely emotional songs. And the wire love to do this. They love to make these wiry. I didn't mean to say that. They love to make these, you know, bizarre, very rhythmically based, inscrutable songs, and just then pepper away within them some of the most amazing hooks and beautiful vocal melodies you've ever heard. There was a sense of like total possibility and boundlessness to Wire in that early era that makes them one of the most exciting bands of the whole seventies to me. And nowhere does it get more simple, more effective, more straightforward than Outdoor Minor. So yeah, that's my pick. I love the song. I love Wire. It's a perfect sub two minute song. Well, my favorite song for this list and a song that we have technically covered before, but I felt the need to come back to this just because it, it gets lost in the minutia of the, the grander sweeping statements of the proper songs on the album. Uh, and just something that I believe this song, my appreciation for this song is what prompted this discussion topic uh, to begin with. So I have this to thank for it. But that being the song Blank Drone from, of course, Illusory Walls. By the world is a beautiful place and I'm no longer afraid to die. My album of the year for 2021 and one of my 10 favorite albums ever. And this little moment here is kind of like the Brockhampton song in some respects. And that this is the first real moment of like 
emotional intimacy on the record. Like everything before this is this like raucous bangery shit. And this takes a moment to pair everything back and showcase a kind of, I mean, like I said, a sh sense of intimacy that really kind of harkens back to the sound on their earlier records, like Whenever, If Ever. Like this kind of reminds me of songs like Picture of a Tree That Doesn't Look Okay from their first record. And this is just a moment that this album takes to sort of appreciate everything instrumentally that is a bit to the side. It's not as you know, in your face as those overpowering guitars or those insane drum fills. A lot of what makes this great is the synth and keyboard tones that are all across this. They are so lush. They're so beautiful. And even the production on the guitar tones that appear on here are so deep. They're what lead you into the song here. And they're a perfect little melodic idea that the song just kind of revisits over and over again and just iterates with different instrumental ideas. Those keyboard tones and eventually the string swells at the end, which are just Oh God, this is this is one of those songs. It's less than two minutes. And then when those when those strings come in near the very end, I'm I'm decimated. I'm over. It's 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 Jover. I'm dead. I'm crying. And this really gets to the core of the themes of the record, which is just kind of about being alive in the world right now and being a lower to working class American specifically. The it begins with the our little box, this tiny room. There's only room for me and you. We have to work, but when we're not, we're making sure we'll save a lot. Because who knows when they'll kick the hive and how the hell will we survive with $100, give or take. The mother bee has sold her steak while the price of food is getting steep. Pray the boss, our jobs to keep. And, there, and he was not there, he never was, and all is drowned out by the buzz. And the lyrical motif here that keeps coming back to is the idea of worker bees and drones which the song gets its title after and just you know being in subservience and connected to your employer essentially in the same way that work bees are connected to a queen bee and that there are there is an inherent intrinsic connection but that there is a fundamental almost sort of uh symbiotic relationship between workers and employers and that just gets more real the older I get and the more jobs that I have. But it's not necessarily about that. It's just about being with someone you care about and having nothing together. And it's just such a potent moment that's distilled into this very brief point where the album really does take a turn for the darker lyrically and thematically. And not only is it kind of a perfect segue between the first sort of third of the record and to the second third of the record, it's just a moment in and of itself. I've always been captivated by it in and of itself. Like the sound of the beginning and end of this song are some of the first things I think of whenever I think about my memories with this album. Yeah, it's a beautiful song. My last pick is... I struggled initially with how to rank these. And then it was like at the 11th hour, this song came along, which I hadn't heard in years. And I revisited the album it was on. And I suddenly had this revelation like, fuck, this is one of the greatest songs ever written. It steamrolled me so completely that in the last 18 hours, since we're recording this right now, in the last 18 hours, I've listened to this song on a loop no less than 40 times. It's a perfectly fully formed song. It is not a song that is lacking in any way, but it is a song that I feel like it could be 20 minutes longer and I would still want to listen to it over and over and over again. And the song is by a band who are known, like Wire, but to an even greater extent, who are known for really short songs that almost feel effortless and that can blur together. And that band is guided by voices, the musical project project of the legendary Robert Pollard. And the song is Game of Pricks off of their 1995 album, Alien Lanes. And this song is a perfect pop song, a perfect rock song, a complete gem in every sense, it has echoes of the Beatles, it has echoes of Big Star, 
it has echoes of the entire history of the intersection between pop and singer songwriter music and it's just this simple and lyrically pointed communication of frustration with yourself frustration with others the endless restlessness towards some kind of contentment towards some kind of resolution to, towards some kind of agreement in terms of how you can exist with someone else be mutually happy but have different wants different needs different desires different lives the game of pricks is life itself obviously it is the constant continual negotiation of every waking moment of your subjective experience with the resistance of the world and all of that blends into this haze of noise in this song as Robert Pollard addresses one particular person in his life who he needs to understand him who he needs to be able to understand and who he needs to have an implicit and explicit acknowledgement with that we're in separate places and we always will be but we can work i've waited too long to have you hide in the back of me i've cheated too long i wonder how you keep track of me you could never be strong you can only be free and i'll never ask for the truth but you owe that to me now that lyric right there i think it's one of my favorite lyrics ever to be honest, I, I've I, I've been thinking about it almost constantly since I revisited this album yesterday and was blindsided by this song. You can never be strong, you can only be free, and I'll never ask for the truth, but you owe that to me. That idea that it's fine, you will never be complete, I'll never be complete, you'll have secrets from me. And you'll choose not to share everything with me. And I'll choose not to share everything with you. And we'll have our own independent lives. But there is this unspoken agreement, this unspoken trust underneath that. I'll never ask for the truth. You keep all the secrets you want to keep. But know that we, but we have to agree to trust each other. We have to agree to have some sense of mutual establishment in this place that we're in, in this partnership that we have in this shared experience we have in this wider world that we exist in and like i don't know in this song i feel like i recognize every relationship i've ever had that worked and the and sometimes unspoken but sometimes spoken negotiations that happen so that you can live an independent life but still have this continued connection with someone who you live with, who you love, who you share it all with together. And I think that's one of the most simple, beautiful, profound, perfect things ever written about human relationships and just living in general. So yeah, Game of Pricks by Guided by Voices is my favorite sub two minute song of all time. I Like I said, I think it's a perfect sugar-coated heavily distorted and lo-fi because that's the guided by voices aesthetic but totally fully realized expression buried in this miasma of cascading ideas across the entire length of this album it is an amazing song and my favorite sub two minute song of all time but let us know at home what your favorite sub two minute songs are, what songs mean the most to you, what you connect with and what you think of our picks. If you have any thoughts, we kind of went a little bit in the weeds. We did that thing we typically do where we do a bit of over analysis, but Hey, that's how we have fun on this show. Want to hear your thoughts. Want to hear your takes in the comments below. Let us know and let's have a conversation. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribing. If you haven't already, both those things help us out a lot. If you want to go above and beyond and become a direct supporter of the Jams and Tea show, become a member of the Jams and Tea family, you can hit the join button for just $1 a month. Get yourself entitled to certain perks, such as having your name in the title call of every video on this channel. Plus, if you want to recommend us some music to talk about, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. Until next time, though, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Verizon. Can you hear me now?